fields and a great green swathe that ran for mile upon mile down the walls of the city. And here's still a bit of it today, growing more or less the same crops. Look at the garlic, the onions, the dill. The dill they use to flavour fish, especially those heavy yellow fish soups they so love. And this, well, this is an ecological Byzantine delight here. There's three or four different sorts of crocs. There's rocket for salad. There's chard and cabbage again. All sorts of things, mint, all growing together in a great profusion. And at the end of it all, lettuce to calm your stomach. So when the peasants in the fields just stop there for a moment and straighten their backs to watch the lords of Byzantium, those great history makers riding by, they too could think, we're not having such a bad time either. The Byzantine economy was based on the classic Mediterranean diet. Wine, grain, cheese and vegetables and olives. Olive oil was a staple. It was Byzantium's fuel. It lit streets and homes and lighthouses. It oiled carts and cured baldness. And it was used for cooking. In its first centuries, Constantinople's oil came mostly from northern Syria. This is a wonderful thing. It's a piece of Byzantine industrial archaeology. It's a factory for making olive oil. This is a marvellous little place. I'll show you how it works. It's very sensible, very logical. The olives were picked from the trees. They came down that little street in wagons. They were tipped down through a window, and they fell into that trough down there. They were then scooped out of the trough and put into this mill. This is a great oil press for the berries. You see this drum? There were two of those, they fitted on end in here, side by side, a bar went between them, and four or five men pushed round the outside and reduced the olives, the skin, and the stone into a sort of horrible, messy pulp. That then was taken out of there and laid in these circles here. Now this thing in the wall here held a great beam that ran through the air. And hanging above this was a huge cylinder of stone. And that then was slowly dropped onto the massive olive paste and the oil dripped down into these tanks. Not the end, because this, after all, although it's cold-pressed, is actually a very impure oil at this moment. So they take it out of here and they put it into this tank here. Now, this tank has already got water in it, so as they pour the olive oil in, it floats to the surface, all of the impurities go down to the bottom. And see this little trench here? A vital piece of gourmet equipment, because this is where the very finest oil ran from that impurity tank down into this tank to make fine, clear olive oil for the tables of Byzantium. This is Sajila, one of 300 ancient Syrian villages with Byzantine olive groves. Provincial Byzantium, preserved in fine-cut stone. Just off the main square is the public bathhouse, forerunner of the Turkish bath. St. John cast whores and devils out of one of these. This is Sajilla's Café come Town Hall down on Main Street. Old soldiers and half-mad saints got drunk in bars like this. Moneylenders, magistrates and merchants did their business here. Can you hear the farmers, tough, independent homesteaders, chuckling about the prices that the city folk were paying for their olive oil? Life was very good. There was time for both the devil and his baths, and for the church and all its works. If you'd have come up this path 1,500 years ago on the 1st of September, 
you'd have been accompanied by thousands of people shouting and singing praises to the Lord. It was the feast day of St. Simon of the Pillar. The first place these processions came to was this great baptistry. 10,000 people, whole cities full, had been baptised in this room in a single day. And then out they all went, praising the Lord, onwards to the Church of the Saints. It's Roman architecture still, of course. Arches, vaults and column tops. But now, there's Christian crosses too. The ancient forms are turning into something else. See? The wind of faith is bending all those ancient pagan patterns. This is the style that would become Byzantium. And at the church's hub, the remains of the 50-foot column on which St Simon lived. So who was this weird man who lived up a pillar and half the world had come to see him and when he died they built this beautiful dancing church in his honour? Well, as a young man, Simon had worn clothes so rough they'd made him bleed. And then he dreamt up the idea of chaining his left leg to a large rock. That before he went up the column. But Simon wasn't a nutter. Simon had tremendous presence like an emperor. He sat still and silent. And in these contests between flesh and the devil, it seemed to most people that he was beyond touch. And there he was on his pillar, halfway between heaven and earth, a perfect man to settle disputes. So they used Simon. The farmers of Syria would come here when they were in arguments and he would settle one against the other. The Bedouin, the Arab Bedouin came to see him too. The emperor used to come to see him. And always he acted as a balance in society. Such a terrifying balance that if he cursed somebody from the top of his pillar, a rock would explode next to the unfortunate individual. So Simon, it was a vital element in this new Christian empire. An element which somehow had taken the old stern order of the Roman age and left it halfway between heaven and earth. In the eastern Mediterranean, in the warm heartland of the pagan world, the first Christian empire, the empire of Byzantium, had found its balance. It was a good life, a rich life, and there was peace and plenty. You know, it always strikes